Thank you for the short introduction that saves me some time. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, one of the ways how we can study historical news networks. And uh, we are going to pick the example of the city of Riga in modern day Latvia and see how this kind of 19th century communication or let's say even press network looks like from that location. And we're going to finish with uh, a case study about the Crimean War that demonstrates some of these capabilities of uh, this method. And yeah, about me, I have a master's degree in digital humanities and I have mostly uh, been working with climate history and environmental history, but also communications and uh, cultural big data. So, I think uh, it's not news to anyone in this room that digitized uh, newspapers is a big hot thing in digital humanities and there are lots of things we can do with them. And one of these uh, research uh, strands for the last 10 years or so has been the research of uh, uh, press or uh, news networks. And there have been several research projects international with very valuable results. Um, and uh, this kind of uh, uh, text, uh, uh, reuse detection has been the main method of uh, this uh, research of uh, communication networks. So this is something of the sort that we can see in pl plagiarism detectors. And uh, it basically is the computational comparison of uh, several texts to see if they can be considered the one text in different forms. So basically this is a very good tool for uh, researching long-term propagation. We can see when some text uh, pops up again after, let's say, five years, ten years, or several months. But it also has its limitations. So, it, first of all, it's very expensive computationally. It needs a lot of training. And it doesn't really work across uh, language borders. So we don't really have uh, this good solution for applying this uh, for on several languages at once. But this, in turn, limits its uh, usage and researching historical press, which is like intrinsically international. So the main question that I parted from is how can we research this more simply? Are there any other ways of uh, uh, making conclusions about these historical networks of communication? So to do this, I wanted to depart from the sources themselves. Uh, so, I work with one specific newspaper called the, the Riga Zeitung, which um, was first published in 1778 uh, in Riga. So, let's take a few steps back. Uh, Riga is the modern day capital of Latvia. And uh, this region, the, the Baltic region, has always been, like now, it has uh, always been this kind of a frontier region. So, in the 19th century, uh, Riga is a huge trading hub on the eastern coast of the Baltic Sea. Uh, it is, at the time, the, one of the most easternmost outposts of this German merchant world uh, because uh, it is, the population of the city is mostly German nobility and German merchants, the so-called Baltic Germans that uh, were this uh, important uh, minority uh, in the Baltic region historically. And at the same time, it is a center of this semi-autonomous uh, Baltic region of the Russian Empire, being the westernmost outpost for the Russian Empire for its Baltic trade. So many of the raw materials um, like furs, uh, timber, and so on that came from uh, the Russian Empire traveled actually through Riga and then on to Western Europe uh, to uh, England and so forth. So. This makes this newspaper a very interesting um, uh, source for studying communication networks because it's uh, located in this kind of double periphery. It is on political borders and on language borders. And uh, this uh, Riga Zeitung has been digitized by the National Library of uh, Latvia, so our good colleagues there, and uh, they have made all the issues from 1802 to 1888 available digitally. So this is the data set that 
uh, is the basis of this presentation. And uh, it covers 86 years and about almost 300,000 articles, which are segmented manually, very valuable, and actually have a quite decent pre-existing OCR, uh, which makes it uh, uh, quite easy to analyze uh, with NLP tools and uh, other um, approaches. So we should look first at how information was actually structured in a historical newspaper. So here is one issue from, I think, the 1880s. And uh, we can see right away that there are some uh, sections, for example, uh, newest uh, news, basically, neueste uh, Nachrichten, and uh, telegraphical dispatches, and then uh, local no news under the uh, title Inland. But if we look more closely, under each of these sections, information is very, very often, we could say mostly, divided into um, single messages that come from specific locations and specific dates. It's because uh, already back in the 16th century, when these handwritten newspapers were the thing, uh, it was always important to supply your information with its place of origin and date. So after it has traveled through the press network uh, for, I don't know, maybe weeks, months, uh, the final reader at whichever point in this network can always trace it back to its origin and uh, have some judgment about how old this piece of information is and uh, is it reliable and so on. So I call these bits of information place date headings. Uh, these are the kind of um, units of information that accompany each news paragraph or like bits of information. And uh, I use the regular expression, actually, to capture them. Uh, usually, uh, place names and dates and, uh, and the like are captured by named entity recognition uh, when we are working with uh, historical newspapers. But in some t uh, cases, this is not the best approach because it requires a lot of annotation. Uh, these uh, models that are actually usually first trained on modern uh, let's say modern German and so on, they might not wor work uh, very well with uh, historical text from the, uh, with, uh, with OCR errors, let's say. So I designed this reg regular expression that captured all of these um, play state headings. I removed the false positives. I normalized, resolved, and linked them uh, to historic the historical place names to the modern ones and also then to coordinates. And I worked with 350 of the most common ones. So this was actually over 90% of all the data. So uh, it just made sure that I can validate each of these place names and I'm not working with uh, some kind of uh, errors. And finally, I also calculated the calendar differences uh, because um, the Russian Empire used the Julian calendar back in the 19th century, uh, which was about 11 days behind the uh, Gregorian calendar used in most of Western and Central Europe. So, as you can see up there, there's Wien and then 28 uh, of April, but they have 16 printed in parentheses. It's because often they use two uh, dates at the same place, te place date heading, but sometimes it was also uh, implicit. So the reader, well, figured out like which calendar system was used for this specific uh, uh, place date heading. And this might have made sense to this person reading this specific issue at the time, but the computation is not that easy because let's say you have uh, uh, like a new, uh, news article from Paris that is uh, three days old. So if this is the case in let's say 1830, uh, we are dealing with a calendar difference. But if it's the case in 1880, it might be well the same calendar system because the speed of news has increased so dramatically. So. Uh, we can use this data, more than 200,000 uh, pairs of places and dates, for quite some uh, interesting analysis. So we can see the geographical coverage here, which is, um, well, not very really surprisingly, mostly uh, confined to Europe. Um, and in Europe, it is the imperial capitals that make up the vast majority, more than half of uh, all of the news flow. And we can also see from the density that the German areas are represented with, that uh, the Riga Zeitung clearly exists, first of all, in this general 
uh, Western and Central European news space, but also more specifically in this German language uh, informational subspace. And uh, just some more diagrams on the uh, importance of different uh, capitals in the data set. Mm, I have div divided it here for, uh, by the year 1860, which I will show you right away why I picked that point. But we can see, for example, that uh, Berlin, which was uh, the fifth most important source of news in the first part of the century, becomes the most important uh, uh, source in the last decades, which is clearly linked to the rise of the uh, unification of Germany and the rise of the German Empire and the political importance of Berlin. So we can now look at uh, the speed of news, or we can just calculate the difference between the publication of a single issue of the newspaper and the origin date of a piece of uh, information. And uh, this allows us to look at how this speed of information was constantly increasing or uh, vice versa, how the duration of news to reach uh, Riga from any uh, given point uh, was continuously decreasing in time. So, for example, if in the beginning of the century, news from New York reached Riga in more than two months on average. So from the 1870s on, we have reached speeds of like two or three days on average for news across the Atlantic and throughout all of Europe. Uh, there are also some defining um, moments um, where modernity <laughs> Uh, affects this kind of speed of communication. So the most important uh, uh, moments for Riga is the first telegraph connection and the first railway line, so in the late 50s and the early 1860s, which, with a little delay, start to affect the speed of news arriving in Riga. So we can see that in the decade following that, all of the news speed from these different locations and for most of the locations from these 350 uh, places that I worked with, drop to just a few days. We can also look at uh, some of the locations in more detail. For example, here is London, and uh, each dot represents one, uh, well, one paragraph or one news from, from London during this period. And uh, again, we can see how the duration for news to reach Riga is decreasing um, continuously. But there are also other interesting elements we can pick out from this graph. For example, here we can see the effects of uh, the continental blockade during the Napoleonic Wars uh, on this information circulation, how it was heavily disrupted for about a decade where uh, well, news from London had a hard time reaching mainland. They had to take uh, alternative routes or they were just uh, heavily delayed. So all this London uh, news, which included very important, uh, uh, let's say, stock market prices, uh, trading news, uh, everything that was of interest for the merchants of Riga, uh, was delayed considerably. We can also visualize all of this uh, in a more playful way. So, for example, in this map, the distances have been skewed, so they do, do not represent physical distance, but rather the speed of information from one or the other point to Riga. And uh, uh, we can see again that uh, this uh, northwestern Europe, this uh, economic zone of uh, London, Paris, the Netherlands, uh, uh, and uh, Germany is kind of uh, metaphorically drawn closer to Riga, which say something about the inf information space uh, where these readers lived in. And this map is only for the data before 1860, uh, where the postal network was the main carrier of news. And if we would do the same computation with the later period, we would get something like this. So, <laughs> which... Uh, uh, which is actually a nice way of showing how, at some point, um, news from distant metropoles that come in via telegraph and have always this kind of sense of urgency to them start to arrive quicker in Riga than news from the same region. So, and, well, computationally, this produces this kind of fold, let's say, 
we could call it maybe a fold of modernity that uh, still, I guess, exists to this day. And um, I would also like to just present a little quick case study uh, on how to use these methods and w w what, we, what kind of knowledge we can get from them. So I used them to study the Crimean War, uh, which took place uh, in 1853 to 1856 with the Russian Empire on one side and the Ottoman Empire aided by Britain and France on the other side. And so this uh, has often been called the first modern war in a sense because it was the first war to be um, substantially photographed that had uh, local news reporters actually on the front. This was kind of the birth of, uh, of war uh, reporting and uh, also telegraph lines that carried this information back into the capitals of Europe where it made its uh, way into the press and then started uh, influencing public opinion and uh, eventually uh, changed the course of the war in the case of uh, the British and uh, French involvement. But in Russia, uh, that means also in the Baltic provinces, news was uh, very heavily censored. So the Russian reading public, not, uh, not, not in the Baltic provinces, but also in St. Petersburg and in Moscow, was in severe uh, shortage of uh, adequate uh, reports on the war. They did not know the situation on the front. So the, um, the public had to resort to rumors and, and such to, uh, to, to gain any insight on what's happening. Uh, so we can use these methods to see how and like what kind of information did these readers in Riga receive about the war. And uh, to do this, I applied topic modeling uh, to the whole corpus. Uh, I used the top to vec uh, algorithm developed by Dimo Angelov. If you have uh, been using topic modeling and you don't know this, I really uh, recommend it to check it out. It is very, very powerful, even with, uh, uh, with the noisy data and uh, produces very, very accurate results in, in my opinion. And of these 385 topics that uh, are in the whole corpus of the whole century, um, well, this can be used for many different analysis. Uh, but uh, I picked out four topics that uh, by both their temporal span and contents seem to match the Crimean War pretty accurately. And I named them war events, uh, which is kind of like the uh, just general reports on battles, movement of troops, uh, situation on the front, etc. Uh, then there is uh, news about the Navy, uh, both on the Black Sea and actually on the Baltic Sea. And then uh, at some point uh, also recruitment and reinforcement. Uh, but uh, this recruitment and the reinforcement uh, uh, are only about the British and French forces, not Russian ones. And in total, these four topics make up uh, 270, uh, sorry, 2,700 news items. And by looking at them more closely, by studying some examples and seeing uh, from which locations these news in these topics come from, we can make some conclusions. For example, that uh, these war news about uh, events on the front mainly come from either Constantinople, uh, Vienna, London, Paris, or Copenhagen. So actually, um, it turns out that uh, uh, the main information printed, uh, printed in the Riga Zeitung about the Crimean War came from Russia's rival powers, the press of England and France. And there was basically no information at all from the Russian capital or the Russian side. Only some single general reports that made up only well, less than 1% of uh, these 2,700 uh, news. Um, while these kind of reports about, uh, reports from the war correspondents, uh, editorial pieces from the Paris and London uh, newspapers, and, uh, and also these um, messages about naval movements on the Baltic Sea, which were uh, especially crucial for, for the readers in Riga, because at some point the English and the French uh, allied fleet entered uh, the Baltic Sea through the Sund, and uh, everything that went past uh, Copenhagen 
uh, was kind of noted and eventually made its way to Riga via some kind of postal connection. And so the readers had to rely on this Copenhagen press uh, uh, to, to know which kind of warships are coming to blockade their port in Riga. Um, so yes, this is actually a really uh, interesting situation that this kind of frontier region, which is uh, politically a part of uh, uh, Russian Empire at this point, but economically and culturally part of uh, uh, Central Europe, is, exists uh, like very clearly in the Central European new space about these, uh, well, in the case of these war reports. And there are also some open questions about this. For example, how did, did this uh, news reach uh, St. Petersburg from Riga eventually? And uh, why wasn't the censorship uh, in Riga picking them out? There were some interesting edge cases, for example, that uh, sometimes um, news from, let's say, the Paris press were reprinted in Riga with some kind of editorial comments uh, attached in the middle, like, uh, yeah, they're saying that they have like 70,000 troops on the ground, but we know that this cannot be accurate because we have counted the, after the previous two battles and they can't have more than 55,000. So it is unclear like at what point this kind of uh, argumentation was inserted into the news, but uh, this need to argue with the information coming from the Parisian press already proves that the readers didn't have, that like the Riga Zeitung, the editors didn't have any better sources at that time. So to conclude, um, the structure of, of historical newspapers is actually very well suited for this kind of uh, network analysis because this was actually the way that the editors, the printers and the readers themselves thought about the press. It was inherently uh, transnational, it was also translingual and uh, it was really kind of a printed network in a sense. Um, so these place date headings uh, are actually a very good complement to more like heavier methods like text reuse. Uh, this kind of lightweight approach uh, allows us to really map uh, uh, these distance and uh, time components of the press with uh, relative ease. And um, it also works across different languages. So because these messages might come from languages uh, other than German, and, uh, and it still works because it always has this uh, play state heading. Well, you may need to do some normalization to, um, I don't know, get from uh, some historical German place name to its modern form or form in another language, but it's relatively easy. And um, if we were to replicate this on several newspapers, let's say pick out another three, four, maybe five uh, periodicals across Europe, uh, this analysis could be uh, done on a much larger scale and uh, carry more weight about this, let's say, general European or even global news network. Because if we can calculate the distances and, uh, uh, and the origin of news from several points at once, it gives us a lot of more information. And finally, um, sometimes the interesting dynamics of any network can be found on its fringes. So as, in, as is the case for Riga, being in a periphery in uh, at least two senses, it uh, has some very important information about how this kind of network functions uh, in general. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And this is the related publication uh, that if you are in a hunger for sources or references, um, you can just uh, type in the link and uh, see the article. So thank you very much.